Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at www.mtsu.edu slash CEM. It is my pleasure today to introduce our keynote. Um, and I've said it before in this conference, but the reason I like to do this conference is because we get to, you know, ask all these amazing people to come and uh, speak. So these are the people that I'd have to go, you know, and find the conference and go see them, but we actually get to have them here, which is terrific. Um, and today, we get to see somebody that is phenomenal uh, at what they do. This is uh, Dr. Young Suk Kim. She is currently the Senior Associate Dean at the University of California at uh, the Irvine School of Education. Before she was the Associate Director, uh, before that, she was the Associate Director of the Florida Center for Reading Research at Florida State University. Uh, she was a classroom teacher, so she has experience in working in K through two, uh, ESL, and high school. She got her doctorate at Harvard um, in human development and psychology with a concentration in language uh, and literacy and quantitative policy analysis in education. Uh, she did her work under Catherine Snow. This is what's amazing is that uh, you've been doing this for just a few years, really, right? I'd say maybe just over a decade, maybe, and already, um, she has published over 130 academic papers. And these are not like just like, you know, fly by night little papers that sometimes you might see. These are like significant pieces of work. Um, some of my favorite uh, articles, actually. She has written 13 chapters and three books. Um, she has published three standardized literacy measures. She's presented at over 150 uh, conferences. She is invited to speak about her work across the U.S. and actually across the globe. Um, she is the investigator or has been the investigator and co or co-investigator on grants worth over $63 million. Um, she is the editor of the journal The Scientific Studies of Reading and the associate editor of the Journal of Educational Psychology and Reading and Writing. Um, she has received many awards, including being named as one of the most productive scholars in educational psychology uh, and the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Uh, we are so honored to have uh, Dr. Young Suk Kim with us today. Good morning. Good morning. It's so nice to meet you. Um, Reading and writing is so close to my heart, um, so it's wonderful to be with people who care about it. Um, so thank you, Amy and everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me here to a beautiful place. It's such an honor to be here. Um, so today, I'm gonna talk about learning to read. I titled it as a Beyond the National Reading Panel Report, uh, Simple View of Reading. Uh, just because people tend to know National Reading Panel Report and Simple View of Reading. So I thought that I would just kind of uh, uh, talk about something that goes beyond those pieces. All right. Um, so I am going to talk about first what we know about how reading develops, and I'm going to talk about some inquiry, the questions that I had. And then a model that I uh, propose called the DEER. And then I'll, I'll talk about implications. And you'll notice that implications part is a little bit uh, short or at high level. But I do do care about in implications and uh, um, instruction a lot. I actually um, teach I, and work with the pre-service teachers and also in-service teachers quite a lot. So. Um, you know, if you want to have a discussion on the implications part and practice, I'll be very happy to as well. 
So first, what we know. Okay. So I thought I would start off big picture because I'm going to go zoom down a little bit before we zoom in on. Let's think about big picture. So we know, so students, so let's think about multiple layers of factors that influence children's development. Right? I'm going to talk about specifically on reading and writing, well, particularly reading, but overall child's development is influenced by uh, multiple layers of factors. So at the center you see student or child and they are different in terms of their dispositions and capacities, right? And that influences their development. The next layer is their homes. Homes differ in terms of their language and literacy practices. Homes or families are embedded within larger community, for example, schools. Schools differ in terms of resources and instruction and many other aspects as well. And schools and community are also embedded within larger system. It could be district or it could be uh, a state level. And they differ in terms of also resources as well as policies. Think about teacher education policy or think about language of instruction policy. They also differ. So the reason why I point this out is because all these multiple layers of factors trickle down and influence children's development. And children's development is really uh, the, the uh, consequence of interaction between the child, the child, uh, how he or she is born with, and then um, these multiple layers of uh, environmental factors. Now, I'm going to zoom in on the child level because everything really trickles down to the child level. So let's think about what it takes to develop reading, simply put. Okay? And I'm sure you have heard about this, but let's take a look. <clears throat> Does anyone here, can, can, can anyone here read and understand this paragraph? Anyone? Okay. Why not? Because of the language. Language. So it's language that you might not be familiar with. This is actually Finnish. Okay. So the language piece, what else? The language is very broad, right? So if you think about, I'll unpack it a little bit more. So first, can you decode this? Because it's Finnish, right? Thank you, Jana. It's Finnish. Finnish has very, very consistent letter sound correspondences. So actually, you can even guess the way you read, right? Sumen, Surin. So you can decode it. I can decode it, and some of you can decode it. Now, do you have comprehension piece? Because that requires language comprehension, right? So that's really the idea of the simple view of reading, right? Simple view of reading, it says, for you to have reading comprehension or for you to read written text and comprehend it, you need two skills at minimum. One is word reading or decoding. The other one is language comprehension. This is a beautiful idea because first, it's simple. Simple is easy to work with. The second reason why this is beautiful is because it has uh, uh, a lot of studies have shown that this works across languages and writing systems, right? Now, there's a downside. When it's something very simple, when reading comprehension itself is very complex, it does not capture a lot of things. It uh, misses out a lot of things. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, there has been some criticisms about it, not surprisingly. So, a few things to note. Quite a lot of studies have shown that skills and knowledge beyond word reading and listening comprehension or language comprehension matters. And here are some examples. <laughs> right? So, 
Reading comprehension requires more than word reading and listening comprehension or language comprehension. And you see grammar, grammatical knowledge, vocabulary knowledge, morphological awareness, reading fluency, all these pieces, right? So then you have a few questions. One question is, how do we account for all these other skills and knowledge in a theoretical framework? The second question is, how are these related? Are they all very independent? Or are they related? If they're related, what is the nature of their relations? The third piece is, how do we interpret these multiple theories? So I just introduced briefly to you something called the simple view of reading. Reading is very complex. That's why a lot of people study, like a lot of people in psychology study, because it's complex. Now, that means there are a lot of multiple theories of reading. So a few examples, simple view of reading, there's something called also a multi-component view of reading comprehension. There's also something called active view of reading, triangle model of reading, there's automaticity theory, verbal efficiency theory, lexical quality hypothesis. There are quite a bunch of things, right? Is it even possible to think about them actually coherently, right? So, then let's think about National Reading Panel. I'm sure you're very familiar with that, right? So National Reading Panel identified five pieces, right? Um, phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, reading fluency, and reading comprehension. That's essentially reading comprehension strategies. One piece I want to note is that this is not a theoretical model. Well, actually, let me put this as well. People sometimes call this the uh, five pieces of five pillars or the big fives. I'm sure you have heard about it. This is not a theoretical model. What this is, is they did a something called a meta-analysis. They looked at all the studies that have been, have been conducted up until, say, late 1990s and see what they found in terms of instructional approaches and what worked and what were some key pieces that have to be taught. And that's what they found, these five pieces. Okay, So this is not really a theoretical framework to, for you to work from. Now, so when I looked at all these things, to me, the literature looked like this. There are lines of work, right? So some people look at some theory and look at it very deeply in that. Some people look at word reading development and look at it very uh, deeply. But it looked like this to me. So I thought then, how can we, is there any way we can actually develop a coherent integrative model, put these things together in a way that makes sense, not only just you know, logically, but also empirically as well. Also, those uh, a model that includes all the skills and knowledge we know that matter to reading comprehension, and also a model that specifies structural relations and uh, shows mechanisms about how things work. So that was my inquiry, and I asked this question in a series of papers. And uh, before I get to that model, let me show you how I approached it. First, what you're seeing is the simple view of reading, right? So there are two pillars, word reading and language comprehension or listening comprehension. And there's you know, uh, reading comprehension. So to get to reading comprehension, you need those two pillars, right? So let's think about word reading side of it. So essentially what this means is when you see these three letters, you read it as a cat. Why? Why do you not read it as a dog or goat? You read it as a, dog, a cat. There's a reason, right? So for that, there's a, a theoretical model called a triangle model. It's called a triangle because there are three pieces, right? So according to this uh, theor theoretical model, what you need for you to read a word such as cat correctly is you need the knowledge of orthography. That means your letters, letter sounds, and how letters combine like digraphs, right? So letter patterns, that's orthography. And you need the phonology, that's phonological awareness. And you also need the morphology, uh, morphological awareness. 
I can talk about all these details, how these, each of these are important for, uh, for English, uh, I guess, speakers to read, to read CAT, but let me just hold it for now, okay? So that's the word reading side of it. And this is a very well established theoretical model. No one really argues against it. And there's a ton, I just listed a few, but there's a ton of evidence, literally. So going back to this martini glass that's really full, <laughs> let's think about then which pieces would go for word reading. If you look at the evidence, some of the pieces here in this martini glass go here because these are the foundational skills for word reading side of it, right? Now let's think about the other side. Now, language comprehension or listening comprehension. So when I thought about this, first question I had was, what is listening comprehension? People talk about it a lot, but what is it really? The second question is, what does it take to develop listening comprehension? OK, so let's think about it. <clears throat> so in terms of definition, what is listening comprehension? This is the definition of, by the people who propose the simple view of reading. Listening comprehension is parsing, bridging, and discourse building. Based on this definition, can you imagine what it looks like? This is actually theoretically very, uh, this is aligned with a very uh, well-established theoretical model called uh, construction integration model. But this is not, it doesn't tell you how to measure it, for example. What is it exactly? It, sh it talks about processes involved in listening comprehension. So parsing, so listening comprehension, when you listen to something, you have to parse linguistic information. That's what parsing is. Parse into phrases and sentences, those you know, chunks, right? And then you have the bridge, I'll talk about it in a bit. And then discourse building, meaning your mental, in your brain as you listen, you have to uh, construct a model of what this text is about. So that's their definition. But it doesn't really tell us how to measure it, for example, what it is. So we thought about it, and this is our the attempt to get at it. We said listening comprehension is the ability to comprehend oral language at the discourse level. I'm going to say a bit in about it. Um, including multi-utterance conversations, stories, and informational oral text that involves the processes of extracting, constructing, and integrating meaning. So the latter part, the processes are not different from what's stated above. What's different is, First, it's oral language skill at the discourse level, meaning it's not vocabulary only. Vocabulary is a word level, right? You understand a single word. It's not just simply a phrase level, right? If I say in the park, it goes beyond that. It's a discourse level. What does discourse level oral language uh, include? When I engage in conversations with people, multi you know, uh, turn, for example. When I listen to stories, do I understand that? When I listen to informational oral text, right now you're doing listening comprehension, right? You're listening to oral text, and you're comprehending following with me, following along with me, that's listening comprehension. This is informational text I'm presenting to you. It's not narrative right now, right? So this is listening comprehension according to our um, working definition. So let's think about then what it takes to develop listening comprehension. So to illustrate this, I'm going to tell you a, a very short story because the story comprehension is part of listening comprehension. Okay, listen. There was a man who worked very hard all his life and saved up all his money. Before he died, he told his wife, listen, when I die, I want you to gather all the money and put it in the casket so that I can take it with me to afterlife. One day, he died. His wife was uh, at the funeral, sitting next to her closest friend. And when the ceremony was over, the undertaker was, about, uh, was ready to close the casket. 
And the wife said, wait a minute. And she put a shoebox in the casket. And the friend said, are you crazy? Did you actually really put all the money in there? The wife said, yes, I sure did. I promised them. I gathered all the money, put it in my account, and wrote him a check. <laughs> The fact that you're all laughing means you comprehend it. <laughs> that means you have listening comprehension skill. It's a short story, right? It's listening comprehension. Now, let's unpack what skills you needed for you to be able to listen and understand this one, right? So when I said there was a man who worked, had worked all his life and saved all his money, now, oh, I, I forgot to say the next line. He was a real miser <laughs> when it came to his money. <laughs> okay. So what do you need? You need to have a knowledge of vocabulary. You need to have an understanding of every single word, right? Especially in this story, you need to have an understanding of the word save. Save have multiple meanings. In this context, it has a particular meaning. Miser is pretty critical here, right? You also need syntactic knowledge. Words combine together and generate new meaning, right? That's syntactic knowledge. And referential inference is, for example, there was a man who had worked all his life, his money, he, who's, who does uh, he refer to, right? That's referential. Believe it or not, you think that, well, you know, everyone, kid, everyone should know this. You know, he is referring to the man who had, it seems very obvious. When we worked with uh, children in pre-K through grade eight, all the way to grade four, we actually tested kids on referential inference knowledge. They have a great difficulty, especially when it comes to uh, informational text, when the pronouns are it or they, they have difficulty, okay? So you need to have inferential knowledge, inferential inference. You also need working memory. So working memory is you, for you to hold some information for some short time and then process information at the same time. So when I was telling you the story, you're listening to, basically you're taking an input of linguistic information, right? So you listen to the sentence, you hold it in your memory, and then at the same time process the meaning, and then you take in the new piece of information, you process it, right? So you need working memory, and everyone has different capacities. Some people have greater working memory than other people. <coughs> Inhibitory control and attentional control. You need to pay attention to really to have a comprehension of the story. You need to pay attention and sustain that attention, right? This is actually a foundation for any type of learning, all learning, right? There's more even. So the, when the wife said, I sure did, I got it all together, put it in my account, and wrote him a check. Why was it funny? <laughs> did I, why was it funny after all? The wife, <laughs> yep, did not give the money away, right? How did you know, did I say that? The storyteller did not say it explicitly, but somehow you figured it out, why, because you made inferences. How did you make inference? You actually used your background knowledge of how checks work in Northern California, right? Personal checks exist in, in California, I'm not California, did I say Northern California? Northern America, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I need to wake up, I got it very late last night. <laughs> and California is it's a two hour behind, so, so, so in Northern America, checks, right, work in a certain way, and it has to be cashed before it works, right? So a dead person, of course, cannot cash the check, of course, that means the wife did not give the money away. I didn't say, I did not lay out all these pieces, but you actually used your background knowledge and connected them. That's making inferences. So p children and people different background knowledge, if you don't have that background knowledge, this story would not make sense to you. If you um, do not have uh, advanced or uh, you know, uh, inference skill, this story would not make sense to you.
right? And children and adults differ in their inferencing skill. Perspective taking. For you to have a deep understanding of the story, you need to understand the storyteller's perspective. This is supposed to be a joke, right? You need to know why I was telling you the story. Understand the perspective of the husband, the wife, and the friend. Right, so there are different perspectives and for you to have full, deep understanding, perspective taking matters. There's also something called a comprehension monitoring. If you teach in uh, elementary school, especially in grade two and above, I'm sure you talk about this, uh, you implement this, you teach comprehension monitoring in the context of reading comprehension. So comprehension monitoring is what it says, monitoring your own comprehension. What does that mean? When you listen to story or when you read story, do things make sense to you? This may be, seem very obvious to you, but again, we worked with children in uh, pre-K to grade four. I say very, and things that are very, very contradictory, they did not catch it or they just let it go. Let me give you an example. So I show you these three series of pictures, right? And then I, I tell you, the morning light was very bright. Chuck and Kenny wanted to go outside and play. Their mother said, no, because it's too dark. Anything odd? Because what was stated in the beginning and what, st what is stated in the later part does not, is not congruent, right? So if you're listening, if you're monitoring your own comprehension, meaning that you have an understanding that when I listen to things or when I read things, things have to make sense to me then you will catch it, oh, this does not make sense. So in the listening context, what did you do then? Your repair, you will take your repair strategy. For example, you would raise a hand and ask question. If it is a reading, you could ask question or you can go back to the text and reread, right? So if you monitor your own comprehension, you are actually being aware of whether things make sense to you and then take uh, repair strategies and there's variation among children. Some kids are um, uh, uh, more advanced or they do employ this, some other kids don't. And studies have shown that kids who employ uh, comprehension monitoring, they do uh, better in listening comprehension and reading comprehension. So going back to this martini and this building structure, right? The pieces here that contribute to reading comprehension, many of them are contributing to that because they are factors that contribute to listening comprehension. So they will go under right here on this side. Okay. Then how about, now my question was, okay, so here are these pieces and also here are these multiple theories, right? Then how, is there any way we can actually put things together in a single theoretical model? So that was kind of a DEER. So DEER stands for Direct and Indirect Effect Model of Reading. And this is one version of DEER. And let me go over this, and I'm going to show you another version as well. This is the version that I share uh, with the teachers a lot of times, uh, because I think this is a little bit more intuitive than the one that I'm going to show you next. So what it shows is it still has the building structure. In the top, you have reading comprehension. And you see multiple pieces, right? These multiple pieces, that means you need, children need to develop everything here to develop reading comprehension. That's why reading comprehension is so complex. Now, on the side, the beam next, uh, right below reading comprehension text is text reading fluency. A lot of people just call it reading fluency, but I call it text reading fluency. And then on the side, word reading and listening comprehension, they look familiar. They are the two pieces that were mentioned in the simple view of reading, right? So the reason why they are there is because if one of them is missing, the building structure would collapse, right? So you need those two pieces that's uh, essential. But the additional piece you see here is to build word reading skill, you need these pieces. Knowledge of letters, letter patterns, sound structure, phonology, and morphology meaning, right? You need these for successful word reading. For successful listening comprehension, 
you need something called higher order cognition and regulation. And they include making inferences, perspective taking, reasoning, uh, monitoring your so setting goals when you listen to stories, or uh, setting goals when you read a text, self-assessment, and self-monitoring, etc. And you need foundational or language skills, vocabulary, and grammatical knowledge. And this, these are under here because for you to reason through, you need language because you think using language, right? So you need actually language skills for higher order cognition. And these are uh, immersion literacy skills, and these pieces are actually connected. They're not completely separate. And underneath it all, you, need, you have uh, domain general cognitive skills or executive function. Uh, that includes working memory, inhibitory, attentional control, shifting, et cetera. I use both terms because depending on the field, some people use executive function to mean something different than some other, how it's used uh, in some other fields. You also see social emotion here, right? On this side, social emotion is your attitude, the self-concept, or motivation towards reading. You also have on this side the background knowledge that includes your knowledge of content or world knowledge, how word works, and also discourse knowledge, for example, different genres and associated text structure, etc. Okay. And I have a bubble here, and I'm gonna go over that uh, in a bit. So. If you think about the theories that I mentioned briefly, those are actually embedded. So text reading fluency is really automaticity theory, and fluency actually is not only here, applies here, but fluency applies everywhere. Your fluency of word reading, your fluency in oral language skills, how fast and accurately can you retrieve of vocabulary knowledge matters, for example. There's a simple view of reading here. There's a triangle model here. Lexical quality hypothesis includes all these pieces in connection to vocabulary here, et cetera. The next one is, this is the more researcher version. It's the same idea, just presented somewhat differently. You see lots of arrows, how things are connected. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to talk about it. So one thing you notice there is the piece right here. It says hierarchical, dynamic, uh, and interactive. So what you see here is these elements or these skills matter for reading comprehension. These pieces in the center is like, how are, uh, what are their structural relations? And I'm going to go over that right now. So hierarchical relations hypothesis. As you can see, right, the word hierarchy, right? So if you think of what it means is lower order skills are necessary and are foundations for high order skills. What do I mean by lower order skills? Those are the ones in the bottom, bottom, bottom. So you see there's one here and then goes to the next level and then goes to the next level, right? So that's the hierarchy. So you need these lower order skills for the next level skill and for the next level skill. That means lower order skills have a cascading or chain effect. Um, so difficulties in lower order skills will cause a chain of influences. So for example, if you have attentional control difficulties or if you have uh, some cha challenges work with working memory, it will influence, because right here, this is important for everything, this will influence things over here, things over here will influence word reading, word reading in influence sex reading fluency, and reading comprehension. You see the upstream um, chain, same thing here, it will go through this way, right? Um, that also means skills and uh, knowledge that are here will have direct and indirect effects or mediate. It's called a mediate effect. And you may wonder about why do we need to care about this? Okay, and I want to give you an example. <clears throat> so, for example, working memory. Okay. So, studies have shown that theoretically, also, working memory, the role of working memory in reading comprehension is very well established. Empirically, there have been some inconsistent findings. Some studies have shown that working memory is related to reading comprehension. Other studies said it's not. So people were like, why? 
Same thing, very similar for uh, vocabulary, right? Vocabulary is, for, is important for reading comprehension. And intuitively, it makes sense, right? If you don't understand words used in the text, of course, you will not have a good comprehension. But empirical studies have shown that some studies have shown, well, it's important. Some other studies have shown that it's not related. Why? So that's inconsistency. And that inconsistency can be explained if you think about things are related in a direct and indirect way. So let's think about it. <clears throat> so if you think about working memory here at the very bottom, Right, as I said, it influences reading comprehension through all these pathways, right? Working memory will influence all these different ways, right? So let me give you an example. So in this study, one study, uh, we measured or assessed kids on these skills that are kind of in maroonish color. So we assess kids' working memory, word reading, the vocabulary, grammatical knowledge, inference, listening comprehension, all these pieces. Okay. So now, a lot of studies before would fit a statistical model like that looks like this. So you have reading comprehension. So how kids do in reading comprehension? Now let's see which one predicts. Right? So you have word reading, listening, comprehension, all these things that I kind of put it in maroon. They put them all together in a statistical model and see which one ends up being related to reading comprehension. So what this test is, is it assumes that everything is related to reading comprehension all very directly because you see the li direct lines to reading comprehension, right? But According to this model, things are not really the working memory. For example, it, there's no direct error there, right? It actually goes through over here. Because what this means is working memory is important to reading comprehension because working memory plays a role in reading the word. It also plays a role because it's important for vocabulary and uh, uh, making inferences, right? So its influence is indirect, is what the model says. So if you fit a statistical model, you would fit a statistical model like this. So a couple of them will be directly related, say word reading and listening comprehension, because these are higher order pieces, higher order skill. So you see word reading and listening comprehension. The other pieces, such as making inferences, uh, understanding others' perspectives, and comprehension managing, vocabulary, grammatical model, they will be indirectly related because they, their influences are uh, through listening comprehension and word reading. And this is the result. So we've examined this using uh, data from uh, second graders uh, in the US. We've compared the several different so-called competing models or uh, alternative models where, say, this is one model. What you see here is listening comprehension and word reading is directly related. All the others are indirectly related because they don't have direct lines to reading comprehension. In other models, I tested whether these have a direct relations. And those models did not fit, so-called fit the data well or did not describe the data very well. So this is the final model that fit or explain the data the best. So what you notice is Listening comprehension and word reading matters. They explain children's performance in reading comprehension. It actually explained almost all the variance in reading comprehension, right? So that was direct relation. But the other pieces, all these other pieces that we know are important, such as vocabulary, working memory, grammatical knowledge, and making inferences, they are not directly related. They're related because, for example, these pieces matter for listening comprehension. This piece matters for word reading, and how they relate is because of through listening comprehension and word reading. Then if you think about now previous studies about why some studies have shown that working memory is sometimes is directly related to reading comprehension, sometimes it does not. So why sometimes studies have shown the vocabulary is directly related, meaning that there is a direct line, and some studies have not shown, is because it depends on the studies where some studies include these higher order skills in their statistical model, 
Once higher order skills are included, of course, working memory's impact will be all subsumed under those higher order skills, and it seems as if it does not relate to reading comprehension. Once you take out those higher order skills, working memory is related. And studies have indeed found that. So it does explain the pre uh, previous inconsistencies and does kind of, I think, mitigate some confusion in the field. Um, so going back to this, right, if you fit this model, this model assumes that everything that I tested here is directly related to reading comprehension. If you fit this model, what you will find is only word reading and listening comprehension are related. And all the others are not related. And you may conclude that, oh, vocabulary does not matter. Oh, working memory does not matter. No, they do. How do they matter? Through word reading and listening comprehension. Let me give you another, another example of why uh, thinking about direct, how things are directly and indi indirectly related. Think about morphology. Kids' understanding of different morphemes, right? Words have smaller meaning unit called morphemes. And according to theoretical this model and also empirical evidence, morphology is important for word reading, kids decoding, and also is very important for vocabulary. So if you look at this, stare at it a bit. Morphology, how would it relate to reading comprehension? Through word reading, it goes this way, right? And then through vocabulary, and this through this way. So is that really the case? How, how about the uh, literature? So we found that morphology is related to reading comprehension through word reading. Uh, also, other studies have found that morphology is actually, in this study, they did not include word reading, but they did include text reading fluency. So morphology was uh, related to reading comprehension through text reading fluency. Voca morphology was related to vocabulary. Vocabulary was related to listening comprehension, which in turn was related to listen, uh, reading comprehension. And other studies also found that morphology was related to vocabulary, which in turn was related to reading comprehension. Again, the point is that all these things matter, but not everything is directly, so-called directly related to reading comprehension. So the hierarchical relations hypothesis shows how things are related with each other, and it shows pathways, how the pathways of all these different elements to reading comprehension, and it clears up some unnecessary confusion in the field. The second structural hypothesis is called interactive relations. So interactive means skills shown here, they develop interactively or bidirectionally mediated by learning experiences. And I'm not showing all the uh, arrows. That means it, you know, the arrows have to be double-headed. But I'm not showing it because it just becomes uh, a little bit too much. So let me give you an example. Vocabulary and reading comprehension. There's a well-known hypothesis called the math effects, right? Kids who have, say, higher uh, vocabulary knowledge initially, right? They do better in reading comprehension because higher vocabulary, you read, you know, the words used in the text, you have a better understanding of the text. Those kids who have a better, you know, reading comprehension, they'll read more because re they're not afraid of, and they don't have anxiety about reading, right? The more they read the more they're exposed to different vocabulary, right, uh, diverse vocabulary, that uh, improves their vocabulary knowledge. And then, so that's a cycle. That's the Matthew effects hypothesis, right? So that, uh, the same thing with the morphology and vocabulary, they are expected to have a, a bidirectional relation. Uh, if your uh, motivation toward reading and read, uh, reading comprehension is expected to have a bidirectional relation as well. If you read well, if you comprehend well, you'll be actually, you have a success. You experience success with reading. That means you're going to read more, right? And then it just goes back. So that's a bidirectional relationship. Um, so it's mediated by your experience with uh, reading. The next one is dynamic. So what I mean by dynamic here is the relations between things here changes as a function of several factors. Well, uh, one factor is development. So 
In the beginning phase, say you're working with the kindergartners, first graders, or maybe some second graders, uh, when you work with them, what primarily determines their reading comprehension is their word reading and decoding. Because it's reading comprehension, if you cannot decode the text, no matter how advanced your listening comprehension is, you cannot really comprehend the written text, right? So in the beginning phase, word reading and associated skills such as all this orthography in these pieces has large influence on reading comprehension. Same thing uh, with uh, text reading fluency. Now, as children develop their um, reading skills, meaning word reading, what's be what becomes more important? Their listening comprehension. Because now, word reading, there's not as much differences among kids. This is not a, a, a roadblock as much anymore. So what differentiates kids in reading comprehension when kids are pretty much in middle school and above is their listening comprehension. Studies have shown, I'm not just arguing this, studies have shown that the correlation, the relation between listening comprehension and reading comprehension after about middle school is about like one. So kids who do very well in listening comprehension, they also do very well in reading comprehension. So that means you need to really pay attention to what's involved in listening comprehension. So continue to pay attention to those aspects. The second factor that influences how things are related to is activity and measurement of construct. What I mean is activity, let's think about like a goals. Say I'm flying and there's a magazine, <laughs> airline magazine. I'm just bored, right? I've done work, I'm tired, I don't wanna just you know, do deep thinking. So I'm just flipping through. So I'm comprehending. Am I gonna really try to have a very deep comprehension and really kind of uh, use all my background knowledge and, you th and try to think about different perspectives in the, this magazine? No. But when I read something, articles, for example, for studying, I'm going to make sure that I reread multiple times that I really understand because I want to make sure that I really make right inferences. I understand the nature of the relations of different uh, parts of the text, right? So depending on the activity you're engaged in, the extent to which you're going to uh, draw on all these pieces are going to be different. Now, another piece is a measurement. So reading comprehension, word reading, listening comprehension, all these, these so-called constructs or something. Now, how do we know how kids do in each of these something? We have to so-called measure or assess. How do we assess? Let's think about comprehension. A lot of times kids read passages and we ask uh, multiple choice questions, right, or open-ended questions that try to tap into, say, literal comprehension, right? Whatever it was explicitly stated in the text. Or, uh, have, uh, you know, kids have to uh, make inferences, right? So inferential questions. Those are very widely adopted uh, measurement choices. Other times, people, kids just are asked to retell the story. Other times, kids are given a passage with uh, there are some blanks, some words missing, and they're asked to fill in the blanks if they are uh, following along the text, they are actually have to. F they are able to fill in the text. That's called a closed task. So multiple ways of measuring comprehension. Do they tap into comprehension all in an equal way? No. Studies have shown that if you construct multiple choice open-ended questions very well, it can actually get into kids' uh, deep comprehension. Retail a close task or maze task, for example, they tap into comprehension, but so-called a shallow comprehension. They rely on kids decoding and also just shallow so-called what was stated in the text, but not really deep comprehension. So it matters. So if you measure kids' reading comprehension using, say, retail or close task, it, uh, say you include an inference, whether inference makes it, uh, uh, you know, uh, is related to, say, kids' performance in closed task or retail, you might not see the relation. Because, not because reading comprehension does not require inference, but because the way reading comprehension was measured. 
Another piece is text features. So if you have so called, for example, comprehension tasks, sometimes, you know, comprehension tasks, comprehension te the text you use in comprehension, they include lots and lots of academic advanced vocabulary words. Some other texts do not. Some uh, texts include very, very uh, complex sentence structure. Some others do not. So depending on the text that uh, kids are expected to read, some require more advanced understanding of vocabulary than others. So one quick example in terms of studies and literature, for example. Sometimes studies find that vocabulary is related to reading comprehension over and above listening comprehension. And that's because um, the words used in listening comprehension is different than words in reading comprehension. If the reading comprehension text, you had a lot of advanced vocabulary, whereas when you tested uh, listening comprehension, it did not require those. And it will look as if uh, vocabulary is important to reading comprehension over and above listening comprehension. It's not because, it's just purely uh, because of the measurement piece. Oh, so if that's the case, then you will appear that vocabulary is actually related to, directly related to reading comprehension. But again, it's because of uh, measurement piece. One final piece about the dynamic relations in terms of text features is orthographic depth. So English has deep orthography. What does deep orthography mean? Letters and sound relation is inconsistent, right? Letter A makes what sounds? A, uh, A, A, uh, A. Uh, uh. It makes all different vowel sounds. One letter represents multiple sounds, and is there a very strong cue about when? There's some cues like closed syllable, like a short A eh sound. But a lot of times, there's no consistent cues. That's called deep orthography. Is learning to uh, read in this deep orthography easy or difficult? It's difficult, right? That's why we pay attention to it so much. Let's think about Spanish or Finnish. Letter A represents ah all the time. Easy or difficult? Easy, right? So. If you're learning to read in English versus if you're learning to read in Spanish or Finnish, for example, the skills that kids draw on would differ. In English, because of the deep orthography, morphology, children's knowledge of morphological awareness is very important. In Finnish or Spanish, it's not as important. Let's think about the word here, right? So would you, can someone read this aloud? React, right? Why would you read it react? Why would you? How about EA? Letter combination. A lot of times, what sound does it make? Long E. So that if you apply that orthographic knowledge, how would you read this? Reeked. But you don't read it as reeked because this word is composed of two morphemes. You have to respect the morpheme. So react. That's why morphological awareness is important for word reading, especially multi-morphemic words in English. That's not the case in, you know, not always the case in other languages. So in English or Chinese, for example, to some extent, actually Korean as well, morphological awareness matters more than some other languages. All right, so let's think about implications. So let's think about implications. So what I presented so far is theory. When I ask my husband, my husband is not a scholar, well, he's not in academia at all. So he actually has, he, he, we've been together for quite some time, like more than two decades. He still does not have a very clear idea about what I do. <laughs> and I asked him, what is theory to you? He said, boring. <laughs> Great, I do something very boring to you. The reason why I actually care a lot about theory is because it actually has very important implications for teaching and assessment. And I 
call this theory, teaching and assessment, I call it triangle of effective instruction, but I'm sure there's a formal name of it. I just call it informally that way. So let's think about what I mean. So what I just presented so far is really theory, right? Why did I spend so much time on it? Let's think about how, when to assess and uh, when to teach, thinking about that theoretical model. I'm sure you heard about it. <laughs> Start early. Why? You're building foundations here, right? Even the so-called conventional literacy skills, such as being able to read words and comprehend the written text, does not occur, say, you know, at the end of kindergarten or grade one or two. The foundational skills that build all these pieces occur way before. So phonological awareness, so knowing letters occur right way before. Kills vocabulary knowledge, their thinking skills, right, making inferences, all those things develop way before. So start early to build foundations. And this is very much well aligned with the prevention model of reading difficulties. That means have a, a screening assessment, catch kids early, and provide an, uh, intensive instruction. This is also aligned with the so-called dyslexia paradox. Dyslexia paradox is um, that we know early intervention is best than later intervention. But the paradox is identification of children with dyslexia occurs at a late, late point, right, grades two and above, right? So that's the paradox. So if you start early in terms of assessment and intervening early, it would prevent that, right? So that's kind of the implications of, uh, for when. Let's think about what and how in terms of instruction and assessment. So I thought about how to summarize it, and this is uh, something I came up with, but I would love your feedback. So we need, for uh, instruction and, and assessment, we need something, an approach that's coherent. Coherent meaning like addressing all these multiple pieces, so multi-component not just addressing word reading in kindergarten. A lot of times, you know, phonics, for example, right, is very, very important. They have to learn. However, that does not mean that you actually have to focus only on this side. At the same time, what do you have to pay attention to? This side as well, right? Because kids continue to develop their vocabulary and thinking skills, right? So that's coherent, multi-component. Also, it has to be systematic. Instead of just a haphazard, it's just an opportunity, whatever opportunity arises. You have to create opportunities. And you have to be explicit. And it has to be sustained, because reading development does not uh, stop in grade two. It goes all the way to college level, adult level. Why? Because at that point, reading is thinking. Right? When you read text, you gain knowledge, and you continue to develop your reasoning skill and problem-solving skill through uh, using the, the text. Right, So it has to be a sustained approach. So if you think about assessment, depending on the, you have to think about the goals and then also think about some of the kind of hypothesis that I proposed. So summative assessment is summative and like a state level assessment. It doesn't really inform instruction, right? The goal is not to inform instruction. But if you think about formative assessment, such as screening, progress monitoring, benchmark, right? Also diagnostic. Or like everyday, daily formative assessment that you do by asking kids, you know, asking questions and et cetera. So depending on the goals, you might think about its relevance, for example, hierarchical relations hypothesis. Uh, if you say work with, oh, I'm going to actually I think I have another slide. So the idea of a hierarchical relations hypothesis when it comes to assessment is depending on the case level, you are going to start at a high level and then go down. So for example, uh, let me actually go here. If you're working with the pre-readers and novice readers, say kindergarten, pre-school, and grade, early grade one, 
For screening, what do you want to screen? Whether kids can read or not. And then the factors that matter for word reading. You want to screen on their knowledge of letters, uh, their, their phonological awareness and morphological awareness, right? If kids do not do, uh, well, that's also part of diagnostic, right? If kids do not do well in word reading, what is the source? Same thing if it is, you're working with these yeah, pre-readers and novice readers, you would want to assess uh, kids' listening comprehension. And if they don't do well, you want to know why, then how, what did you assess? Do they, uh, is, is it because they don't do well in making inferences? Or is it because they have a uh, you know, vocabulary that is small, they don't have advanced vocabulary knowledge, and et cetera, right? So that would be hierarchy because you go, you start at high level in terms of screening and then you go down in order to identify why. And then in terms of teaching, coherent, explicit, and sustained approach would uh, apply in terms of scope and sequence, considering structural relations, right? So if, you are, if you're teaching word reading, you're going to have to teach all these three pieces here. And you're going to do it explicitly and systematically. And if you're, gonna, if you're teaching listening comprehension, you want to address all these pieces. And how do you do it? based on assessment. Some kids already have a very advanced knowledge of letters. Do not teach. Those kids don't need letter knowledge anymore. Um, they might need some more instructional morphology or any other language skills, right? Or your assessment revealed that actually some kids actually already have pretty advanced oral language skills. They listen and comprehend very well for their age. And, but then the child does not actually have a good ex uh, knowledge of letters and those other pieces, then spend time on this side of it. So that would be systematic instruction. That would be what you know, differentiated instruction. And that's how you link assessment to teaching. And it's these two pieces are linked to theory because based on the theory, these are the ones that matter, right? So that's pre-readers and novice readers. If you work with uh, students who are at a beyond initial phase, then you would actually have to think about all these pieces, right? So say you're working with third graders. You want to, in the very beginning of the school year, you would assess the reading comprehension, see where they are. And then you see that while some kids uh, are not doing well, that you want to see why, then you are going to assess reading fluency, word reading, and listening comprehension. And then, if their reading struggle with reading is really due to word reading, you will spend a lot of time on this. If their struggle in reading comprehension is really primarily because of this, then you will spend a lot of time on this, right? So that's really uh, the piece. One piece that I wanted to explicitly mention is the hierarchical relations, meaning that lower order skills are necessary for the higher level skills, does not entail delayed teaching of higher order cognition skill. So for example, uh, making inferences, perspective taking, you can teach those to kindergartners. You can teach that in second graders all the way through. I actually have oral language intervention where we actually teach kids explicitly not only vocabulary, you know, sentence structure, but also, okay, when you listen to story, you have to make sure that things make sense to you, but also here's the information you listen. How can you connect the dots? This A, person A is thinking this, person B is thinking this. We are teaching all these things in kindergarten already because that's field building foundation and that can be taught very early on. I think that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know how much time we have. Five minutes? Questions? Questions or thoughts? Yes. Yes. In connection to your. Oh, oh okay, thank you. <laughs> In connection to your um, model of construction to um, integration model, your list for listening comprehension, you said multiple utterance. Can you go into that? What do you mean by that? Multiple utterance? 
uh, okay, so that's, for example, you and I have a conversation. So say you asked me, how was flight last night? And mm -hmm. I say, oh, it went fine. Um, but you know, there were delays, you know, there were multiple delays and et cetera. And then you're gonna tell me something, you're gonna ask me something, right? So that, that is multiple utterance conversations, for example. For that to happen, you have to actually understand not only all the words that I'm using, but also you have to understand my intentions as well, right? So there's some people you might recognize, some people actually are good at just continuing to engage in conversation. Some kids are not good at it, it just stops. <laughs> that happens, right? And some kids actually do not have a very good understanding others' perspectives and the situation, and sometimes conversation is awkward, right? <laughs> that happens. So that's kind of what I mean by that. that's part of listening comprehension. Yes? Um, so we know that the working memory is the foundation as far as cognitive skills. Uh, okay. right. <laughs> um, but working memory cannot be repaired Mm -hmm. So how, what is your suggestion or your advice or insight into tackling that for struggling readers? That's a very, very good question. So there's a, in the field of cognitive psychology, there's a very different views, right? So um, some evidence suggests working uh, memory can be actually, you can actually train kids in improving working memory. Um, and then it can have impact on kind of so-called digital outcomes such as you know reading and et cetera. Others do not find such evidence, so there's a huge debate about it. I actually have a colleague, one of my colleagues is a leading expert on that. So I had actually a chance to um, um, collaborate and look at, the, we're working on it on publication. What we did was, I'm gonna get to your question about what to do about it. <laughs> what we did in our study was um, vocabulary intervention. We have experts here. Um, so we taught vocabularies you know, based on evidence, right? So multiple exposures, you know, child friend uh, definitions, you know, providing examples, non examples all those things. And then another group, we taught all those things with the working memory intervention. We had all those other conditions as well. And what we found was actually the one where the working memory and vocabulary was on the cusp of better than just teaching vocabulary uh, alone, but because of there's some issues of kids' uh, equivalence in the baseline, it did not quite so-called reach, reach that statistical significance, but there was pretty, uh, there's a kind of suggestion of it that improves um, adding working memory training could, might perhaps, so uh, some people really argue working memory is you're born with a certain capacity, you're done with it. Some people think that no, that's not the case. If you actually um, work on it and actually your learning experience actually helps with uh, actually um, developing your working memory capacity. That's one piece. There's argument about it. What can we do about it? Um, I will give you an example of what I do. Uh, when you're working on multiple things, right, what do you do? You take notes, <laughs> right? Um, so for kids, when you work with kids, especially so who seem to have um, you know, some challenges with uh, working memory and also attention control, you might want to think about just putting things, reminders here, directions here, some, some sort of signals that can go back, and that can be a scaffolding approach. Um, that's what people usually do. Um, if you have any other suggestions or uh, approaches that worked well, uh, feel free to share with us. Any other thoughts? That was a really good question. Thank you. Yes. Is there anybody, is there anybody currently um, developing curriculum <coughs> or based on or incorporating the DEER model? The entire piece? Yeah. I'm sure publishers will um, claim it. <laughs> I, I actually, so that's a really good question. So, you know, I haven't looked at all the, you know, published materials, right? Um, so my understanding of the currently available in the market is that, um, 
you know, if you, so a lot of them now pay a, a lot of attention to the word reading side of it because of science of reading, debating, etc. Now the comprehension side of it, it depends. Um, you know, some people just do so-called read alouds and they go deep. Some people don't, and some publishers don't. I think that. And also, it depends on what you mean by kind of theoretical model, whether they can actually, you know, if you, for example, if you look at this attentional control, it's beyond this fear. It's actually management skill as well, right? So um, I'm not sure if there's, <laughs> but I'm sure there, you know, there are uh, materials that addresses bits and pieces, and I don't know how integratable well they do? I don't know. That's a great question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Yes, Jenna. I was curious about the socio-emotional piece, which you put at the top of the yes. hierarchy. Yes. Um, why is it at the top of the hierarchy, uh, and might it go elsewhere? Yes, I, uh, that's a good question. In this, not in this model, in this uh, version, but the more researcher version, I put it at the top. Not because it's really high order per se, but because I felt that that was really the place. And here you see that it's right here. It's very closely uh, here, ne next to word reading, text reading, fluency, and reading comprehension. This is because my understanding of the literature, when I look at studies that looked at children's motivation, attitude, and self-concept and self-efficacy toward reading, is that it's really based on their uh, experience with uh, reading. So uh, some of you might have, rec my, you know, who work with kindergartners, and you ask kindergartners, how do you feel about reading? And you give happy face, sad face, and neutral. They're all, almost all, very happy. Right? Because they haven't had as much experiences. They haven't experienced difficulties or challenges yet. By the time you ask them in grade one, you'll see quite some differences. Some kids show sad faces, or some kids still show happy faces. What studies have shown that is that this develops really, really closely in relation to their experiences with word reading. If they fail, if they find the word reading is so, such a struggle, and laborious, of course, they're not going to feel good about themselves, right? Same thing when they read the text. If they're like, OK, a bunch of things, I don't know what to do with it, of course, it's going to influence, right? So what studies have shown that this experience really kind of begets how they feel about it. We actually did whether you know, kids knowledge of letters and their phonological awareness and these things are imp impacting social emotion, their motivation, they actually do not. Because for them, understanding says, you know, uh, you know, raincoat has a raincoat, does not seem to be related, it does not really relate to, they don't see the connection to reading, right? So they don't really uh, connect to reading, so it doesn't seem to their uh, feelings toward word reading, but then when they actually struggle with reading itself, that seems to influence the way they feel about it. That's why it's located there. Yes. So if we work on the socio-emotional aspect, right. can that help influence everything else? If we can help change their attitudes toward reading, can that help them unless there is an issue such as dyslexia to improve reading? That's a great question. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, my understanding of the literature is actually the direction, you know, so it's a uh, cycle, right? It could be a virtuous or vicious cycle, right? But where the starting point is their reading experience and word reading skill. So if they start out very low and they do not have a very good experience, they're going to feel negatively and then et cetera, et cetera. So I think in terms of a teaching moment is when kids do not seem to do very well, it's teachers how they approach that. Oh, you're so bad at reading. You're not a good reader. No, right? Oh, let me help you. You're very smart, but this is something. So let's just unpack it. Let me provide scaffold. Then you might actually kind of mitigate that piece. And then cycling back, right? Kids kill, do not feel bad about their reading, and then they're going to engage more reading practice and et cetera. Now, dyslexia, I think, is different. 
because dyslexia, by definition, is per persistent and profound difficulties, despite all this, you know, very solid instruction and etc. And there's definitely there's you know, the, um, kids' nature playing a role there as well, right? So. I think it's an important aspect when you approach it, whether that's going to address, but you have to fundamentally address the skills, right, the sources. And then their, say, anxiety towards reading or attitude towards reading will be addressed as well. So I think that addressing the pieces is really important, as well as teachers' attitude. Um, how they carry about when they teach reading, right? I think that's very important as well. Okay, we'll take one more. <laughs> we need to move on. Okay, so I was thinking, like, is there anything where application is the biggest focus of it all? Because I believe children have a lot of these skills, but they utilize them for, like, my baby can access her phone and get to the camera, and she can do a lot of things with her phone. But when I sit her down for the reading portion of it all, then she starts to, oh, my brain, it hurts. And yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> I just think if maybe we could bring that real life experiences. So I see a lot of kids do Roblox. Um, uh, the other one, they do coding, and they don't realize that they're actually coding. Like, I saw my nephew make the guy fly, but he put in a code and put fly in there and used the brackets and all of that, mm -hmm. and he started flying around. And I was like, oh, you're actually doing something you don't even know you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, I, like, is there a way to teach them in a method to where you don't even know you're learning to read, mm -hmm. but you are using your working memory, you're mm -hmm. using all of these high-order skills, and maybe, like, we in the morphology mm -hmm. and all of those things into one? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I think, um, you know, I don't think everything can be gam gamified and I don't think, you know, every lesson has to be fun. But what you, I think what every lesson has to be engaging, right? So when you teach morphemes, for example, you can actually make it uh, like a game. Right, for example, when you say react, oh, let's think about react. Do you hear something, re or maybe react, redo, you just present some words, what do you notice, right? So as long as you can capture that attention, right? So I think those kind of engagement piece is important. But going back to, I think, a larger question, I think it really knowing the kids, right? Their interest. So you actually try to embed all this, so you, they read about text, about game, I don't know, Roblox, right? Or you come up with a text um, that makes them think about, um, you know, uh, have to, they actually have to figure out things on the topics that they're interested in, right? So I think that's kind of where your magic happens. You learn about the kids, so the so-called interest survey, or you just know them. And then, so that's where a lot of your work comes in beyond the curriculum publish of uh, materials. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>